Namaste, Sashrikal, and very warm welcome to everyone here uh, in the audience. And uh, the subject of this webinar is somewhat provocative and perhaps even a bit controversial. However, before we get to the subject itself, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our guest speaker, Shri uh, Amish Tripathiji. Uh, Amishji, namaste. A very warm namaste. welcome to you on uh, uh, this platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jayaji. Pleasure. Uh, so uh, now, Amishji probably does not need a whole lot of introduction to this audience. However, tradition demands that I say a few words about his background, which is very extensive. So in uh, brief, uh, Amishji is a very popular and well-known author, a former diplomat, and a broadcaster. He has written 11 books, both fiction and nonfiction, from 2010 onwards. His books have sold over 7 million copies and have been translated into 20 Indian and international languages. Indeed, he is the fastest selling author in Indian publishing history. Now, Ameshi has received many awards during his career, most recent being the prestigious Dwarka Prashad Agrawal Award at the Jaipur Literary Festival of this year. As a broadcaster, he has hosted Discovery TV's successful and award-winning Legends of the Ramayana with Amish and Journey of India. He has also produced and hosted the highly acclaimed documentary, Ram Janam Bhumi, Return of a Splendid Son on NDTV and Geo Cinema. In his diplomatic role, Amish worked as the Minister of Culture and Education at the Indian High Commission in the UK, as well as the director of the Nehru Center in London. Ameshji is an alumnus of the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He has received the Eminent Alumnus Award from the IIM Calcutta in 2017. He worked for 14 years in senior roles in financial service industry before turning to writing. Ameshji, once again, a really warm welcome to you. Thank you. Now, uh, now, returning to the topic itself, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the topic is slightly controversial, the way it is worded. Um, now, how do I know this? It is because a lot of people who I respect deeply have written to me in what I would describe as somewhat strident tone, suggesting that we should never even raise the possibility that British could have had something to do with formulation of India as we know it today. Fair enough. To their credit, I would concede ab initio that the proposition that British could have united India is ludicrous. They were fundamentally a colonizing force with a very simple agenda, that is to rob India of its wealth. In doing so, they adopted every possible mean to destroy the very fabric of Indian society. Their operating credo was divide and rule. They caused the bifurcation, or I would say trifurcation of India. So how could anyone with a sane mind argue that they were the uniters of India? However, as ridiculous as that proposition might seem, the narrative is already out there. Mm. It has been promulgated by no lesser personality than Nehru himself. Partha Ch Chatterjee, a prominent historian of the leftist ill, has pushed this narrative in his writings. Even Shashi Tharoor, notwithstanding his famous Oxford speech and his famous book, The Inglorious Empire, has suggested that British played a significant role in defining the geographic and political contours of modern India. So with that sort of narrative out there, in the public consciousness, I think it is not only okay, but it becomes our responsibility to tackle this issue head on and counter it with arguments from the perspective of our civilizational history. And who is better equipped to do that than our guest speaker, our eminent guest speaker, 
Shri Amish Tripathi Ji. So Amish Ji, with that, the floor is entirely yours. And I would simply request our participants or audience to, as you come up with any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. We will take them, as many of them as possible, at the end of Amishi's conversation. Thank you so much. Amishi, all yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Jaiji. Uh, and what I think I will do is make some opening remarks, uh, you know, and keep it more interactive. It will be more difficult for me, but it will be uh, better to uh, to respond uh, to questions so that I can address uh, issues. Um, and I think what uh, the the gentlemen and uh, ladies who may have uh, got back to you that even this proposition itself is ridiculous. I think that should be addressed first. You addressed it partially, but let me just say this. One of the things uh, our ancestors used to always say is that saying that our enemies are ridiculous or uh, enemies may be an emotional term. Let's use the thing that those who oppose our civilization uh, are ridiculous uh, does not really help the argument uh, because that's an emotional reaction to an intellectual argument that has been foisted upon us and that has been running for, for a few centuries and that sadly many in India and many people of Indian origin abroad also believe. The response to this must not be emotional. The response to this must be arguments. Calm, centered arguments that if someone comes and says India never existed. In fact, I, uh, you know, that what, that how can we respond to it in a calm, rational manner? As has been said beautifully in the uh, Natya Shastra, Satyam Bruat, Priyam Bruat, speak the truth, but speak it with love. That's how we can convince others of our point of view. I'd put up a podcast on this very subject, uh, Jayaji, on my YouTube channel, Immortal India with Amish, on, in fact, on this subject as well. And in that, I actually quoted videos of prominent opinion makers in India. And I'm not just talking about individuals in a Jawaharlal Nehru University or establishment historians who you would expect to think this way. But even say uh, someone like a Bollywood historian, a Bollywood uh, actor, Saif Ali Khan, right now, he wouldn't have read as much, but he said, yes, from what I know, the British uh, created India. Now, where would he get such a concept? From his schooling and his college. And in fact, in that video, we posted the views of another JNU professor who said that, yes, Saif Ali Khan would have learned this from his school, which means this narrative is actually there in Indian schooling, that the British created India in many of our boards, as I'm sure many in this audience would be aware. There are many uh, boards in India. There isn't one uh, united board. There are a few national boards like CBSC, ICSE, etc. There are state level boards as well. And trust you me, in many state boards, it is being taught that the British created India. Uh, so this is a paradigm that does exist. Now, how do we respond to this? One way of responding to this can be emotions. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. Uh, the reality is. Uh, uh, I think uh, among the things that's taught to us in the Mahabharata when they say, you know, ki, uh, only a warrior should fight a warrior, only a businessman should fight a businessman, only an intellectual should fight an intellectual. The logic of it was not actually casteism. The logic of it was, you know the area you're competing in. So then you will know how to argue. If you use violence in an intellectual debate, uh, if the other side has violence as well, you will lose. If you lose, use emotions in an intellectual debate, you will lose. Uh, so then what are the intellectual reasons we can give? I think the best way to ask it is what are the things that people say that to claim that India was never a nation? The first thing that most establishment historians, leftist historians may say is give us textual proof that a concept called India existed. Right? A concept called Bharat existed. They will claim that your name itself is not Indian. right? Because India is a Western name. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be true for the word Egypt. Uh, Egypt is not an original Egyptian name. The original name of the Egyptian was actually Kem. The name Egypt comes from the Greek uh, word Egyptos, which had nothing to do with Egypt. Right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, and the Greek word Egyptos became anglicized to become Egypt. That is the root of the name Egypt. So when they say that Egypt is not the original native name of Egypt, fair. Okay. Uh, but to say India is not linked to our land India and only Bharat is may not necessarily be true. Bharat, I agree, is our, uh, is our original name. But India is linked to India as well because what is the root of the word India? It is the river Indus, which is the uh, uh, the Hellenization of uh, the word Sindhu, uh, which is actually uh, the river which defined uh, the boundaries of, of India. So even that is actually linked to our country. And there are various other terms uh, for our land, of course, Ilavarta, Ajana Bhavarsha, various other names. Uh, but if they say, give me a textual evidence that the concept of India actually existed in ancient times. Uh, well, an answer we can quote is from the Vishnu Puran, which is a two, two and a half thousand, at least historians tell us is, is two, two and a half thousand years old. I believe the Vishnu Puran was a lot older, but the Vishnu Puran has this lovely line. Uttaram yat samudrasya himadra chaiva dakshinam varsham tada bharatam nama bharti yatra santati. That north of the ocean and south of the Himalaya lies the land of Bharat. And there live the descendants of Bharat. This is textual evidence that the concept of India existed uh, in ancient times. The British didn't create the concept. Indians, our ancestors, created the concept. Uh, then they say, okay, it may have been there in the text. Okay, Did the people actually believe it? Did the common people believe it? Did foreigners who visited India believe it? Fortunately, there is evidence for this as well. Now, like I, like I said, I'm giving intellectual evidence and arguments that you can use to argue against someone who says India didn't exist as a nation. So let me give you an example from a book, uh, from a series of four books, actually. Uh, it's called The India They Saw. It has been compiled by uh, Padmashri historian Meenakshi Jain. Uh, and it actually records the travelogues of foreigners who came to India in the last two and a half thousand years. So from ancient times, 500 before common era, ancient Greeks, right down till modern times. So ancient Greeks, ancient uh, Westerners, then the Turks who came, and then of course the British who came later. Uh, well, the uh, uh, Diodorus, for example, a visitor who came, described India as one land, as a quadrilateral shaped land, which uh, was bound by the Imodus mountains. Imodus was their term for Himalaya and, and Hindu Kush. They saw it as one mountain range and the seas to the south and east and the Indus River to the west. That actually describes India. Pretty much how even the Vishnu Puran text uh, describes it. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the third or fourth century common era, there's a travelogue of Sinhalese Buddhists coming into India. Again, this is there in that book uh, that has been compiled by Meenakshi Jain. Sinhalese Buddhists who came from Sri Lanka into India. They got off the narrow straits of the Pork Straits and came into Tamil Nadu. And they recorded the moment they came, they their feet touched Tamil Nadu. They went down on their knees and kissed the ground. Why? Because this was the land where Gautam Buddha was born. Think about it. They landed only in Tamil Nadu, which was what? 2,000, 2,500 kilometers from the Indo-Nepal border where Gautam Buddha was born. But for these foreigners, it was very clear this is India. Tamil Nadu and Indo-Nepal border, same land, same Bharat, same India. These are textual evidences that we can use to fight a cogent logical argument, not getting emotional. Um... Uh, a very obvious argument that I used actually in the UK when I was a, a when I was a diplomat out there, that if the British themselves believed that India didn't exist, why the hell did they name their company East India Company if India didn't exist? They should have said East the comp the nation that doesn't exist company. You know, they knew India existed. That's why they named it East India Company. Uh, and if you see British records. In the early times when they came, that is before they actually got their empire, they acknowledged uh, the historical antecedents of India. They changed it only when their imperial policy changed. Now, all this is there uh, in their own text. And of course, I quoted it in my podcast as well.
so this is these are examples that can be used textual evidence to show the cultural unity of india but then there is another argument that can be used that well okay you may say cultural unity but there was no political unity you had no state which controlled uh, all of india now what what is the answer to that because then they can claim that india wasn't a nation well the answer to that is nations in ancient times were actually cultural not necessarily political for example in europe much of northern europe was actually ruled by english kings much of northern france after uh, battle of agincourt i'm sure many of you would be aware of that uh, was ruled by english kings that didn't mean that northern france suddenly became english in nation right but the state was english right uh, similarly when the normans conquered uh, the uk the ruling elite was french that doesn't mean that the english nation disappeared what do i mean by this political authority and cultural nations were actually two different things in ancient times because polit the sovereign were never the people the sovereign was the king so for example in 15th century england if you said you were loyal to uh, to england and not to king henry you'd be beheaded as a traitor right because the sovereign weren't the people the sovereign was the king right he, in his or her personhood uh, if it was a queen um, the concept of a modern nation state where a cultural nation and a state uh, become one is actually it actually emerged from the treaties of westphalia in which were in the 17th and 18th century in uh, in europe right so if you say that a political nation state of india didn't exist in the 14th century okay then the political nation state of england also didn't exist or the uk also didn't exist right that doesn't mean that the nation of england didn't exist you have to understand cultural and political were two different things uh so that is not an argument that can be used to say india doesn't exist uh because political union was driven by the monarch not necessarily by the people and the third concept that we should use is the concept of a civilization state india china russia japan to some extent these are actually civilization states which are even bigger than the european concept of a nation state a nation state the according to the peace of westphalia is essentially defined by one language one uh, race one religion Uh, and in their concept of one religion protestant christianity and catholic christianity were also two different religions uh but a civilization is a much broader concept uh it's not merely just one religion one race uh, one language it is a it is a common set of philosophies and principles that unites so for example uh uk us uh uh canada australia new zealand may be five different nations but they are a part of a larger civilization called the anglosphere right or uh saudi arabia uae libya egypt may be different nations but they are a part of a larger civilization called arab islam dub but india is actually a civilization and a nation so we are more than a nation we are actually a civilization state these are the intellectual arguments that uh, i have used often to argue uh, the case the ancient historical case for india some of which i put in my podcast as well which can be seen on youtube immortal india with amish just search for author amish on youtube and you can see it and uh, of course very happy to answer questions sir if uh, there are many yeah so there's one question that uh... Uh, I just see see in the chat. I mean, the Q and A box is uh, uh, from Saurabh Ji. He's asking, how can we explain the stark difference between the scripts and languages from north to south? So he's talking about the, for example, the Malayan language versus say uh, northern languages, Sanskrit right. languages. Fair point. Uh, it's a good question. but again uh, this would be a uh, troubling for uh, the european concept of a nation state it is not troubling for a civilization are there differences in our languages of course there are uh, 
Now, the way to see our language, there is Vedic uh, Sanskrit, but the Sanskrit that most of us know today is actually classical Sanskrit, which was uh, uh, form, uh, the rules of which were formulated by Panini, the great uh, grammarian uh, from uh, Gandhar, uh, is what, is, uh, from Kan uh, what is today Kandahar in Afghanistan. Uh, there was a time that area was very intellectual. Um, uh, difficult as it may be to, to, to believe now. Uh, Vedic Sanskrit was far more uh, flexible as compared to classical uh, Sanskrit. Uh, there are also parts of Vedic Sanskrit that were lost uh, in, uh, you know, when uh, uh, Panini formulated the rules of classical Sanskrit. Vedic Sanskrit gave rise to the, uh, uh, to the Prakrut uh, languages as well. So Vedic Sanskrit, you can say, was the original mother and classical Sanskrit and uh, the Prakrut languages, you can say, are actually in some ways the descendants. Um, there is another set of languages as well in India, which do follow a different set of, but there is a strong uh, intermingling between them. As I'm sure those who've lived in India, you will realize actually Marathi and Malayalam are two languages actually that are closest of the modern language. Are the, close, are the ones that are closest to Sanskrit in their pronunciations, in their, uh, in their tone, etc. Uh, but the differences in languages would only worry you if you saw a nation in the European concept of one religion, one race, one language. But that's not the way we see our nation. We are a civilization. We are much bigger. We can have multiple languages, but they are linked to each other. Uh, so the way to see our nation is not that every flower is a rose. You can have a rose, you can have a marigold, you can have a uh, Rajni Gandha, you can have various different flowers, but there's a string of Bharatiyata which actually runs through them. And that's what creates the garland uh, of our nation. That's the way to see it. So you're right, there are differences in the languages, but that's not something that would trouble uh, our concept of nation. Yeah. So, Amishji, um, you know, let's let's try to address the elephant in the room. What is the what are the practical implications of this argument that says British actually constructed India as we know it today? You know, what are the social political implications of that? Uh, you know, that assertion. Uh, the the biggest political implication, if our nation didn't exist. <clears throat> Uh, is that uh, breaking up the nation then becomes very easy, right? Uh, and uh, the nation becomes a lot weaker. But that is an obvious uh, answer, Jaiji. Yeah. I think a deeper uh, concept, uh, there's, this, uh, there's this concept called the Stranger King. There's a, uh, a European historian who'd come up with this, uh, uh, with this concept. I think Wilhelm... Uh, so I'm, I'm forgetting the name. Mm -hmm. And this was used to explain uh, the British kings uh, who had ruled Borneo Island. I don't know if you're aware of that. There were white kings who ruled, you know, uh, what is now part of it is in Ind Indonesia, part is a, in Southeast Asian island. They'd come from Europe. Uh, they were white. They spoke English. And yet they didn't actually have to conquer the land the people themselves shows ki bhai, it's better if they rule. Okay. Why did they do that? There's this theory called the stranger king. Okay. If there are many tribes, 30, 40 tribes who are fighting each other and they don't want any one tribe among them to become too powerful. Okay. Then what do they do? There are 40 of us. We are related to each other. No one of us should rule. How about if we get a stranger from outside? Okay, because he's equally dissociated from all of us. He will mm. not pick any one side. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, and then natch it's it's I know it sounds strange, but actually you've seen it in history. Many Europeans became there's and it's an actual historical concept called the stranger king, someone who's an outsider. So all the in-group who have internal divisions will sure. accept him because he mm. right? mm. so he'll be fair to everyone. Hmm, if you convince Indians that our nation didn't exist, won't we naturally accept a stranger king then? Sure. 
because if we think you know i if i am from up my roots are up and maharashtra right my father's family is from up i was born in maharashtra if i start believing i have no commonality with tamil with a tamilian i have no commonality with a kashmiri then i'll think are why should i let a tamilian dominate me that's what i might start thinking which is a wrong way to think but naturally then yaar kisi videshi ko le aao correct and if you divide the nation a stranger king becomes a natural course that is the deeper insidious uh, uh, aim and i think it probably uh, helped an elite even after independence because they would be stranger kings across the land because they didn't speak any native language they would speak english so there is a uh, another question in the uh, q and a box i'm not sure if it's totally related to the topic at hand but uh it's about uh, the use of astronomical uh you know calculations to prove the historicity of various you know puranic events and things of that nature nilesh ok is mentioned as one of the uh, you know one of the proponents of that but there are many more uh what's your take on on that entire uh you know use of astronomical science um you know and its implications on our pranic history no i think there is uh, something in there i but uh, i should admit i'm not a uh, i'm not an astronomical uh, scientist i'm bsc maths and uh, then mba but uh, one uh, physical phenomenon which i'm sure many of you would be aware of uh the earth uh, doesn't just rotate on its axis it also wobbles a bit if you mm. played with a top when you were a uh, when you were a child when you spin the top it actually wobbles a bit when it becomes a little slow i'm sure you remember that so the earth yeah. also actually wobbles a bit like this it doesn't just spin on its axis it actually wobbles no, and it no. comes back to its original space original spot once every 22000 years so the mm. wobbling is such that one entire cycle takes 22000 years which intriguingly matches with the human you know the satyog treta yog dwapar yog kali yog are ages mm -hmm. uh, exist at a human level deva level brahma vishnu lord shiva level but at a human level that cycle is actually 22000 years so it actually matches that this concept of this earth wobbling is called precession okay now mm -hmm. if the because of precession if the earth is wobbling obviously the sky will also change the nakshatra will change uh so and our texts our ancient texts were full of uh, uh nakshatra uh, descriptions so you can enter the description in a software and you'll and it'll tell you which period could the sky have been that way it could only be 22000 years earlier or 22000 years later because of the concept of precession uh if you use this then actually you can date many of our events uh and this needs greater scientific uh, research no doubt but uh, it certainly pushes back our history a lot earlier than many people believe yeah actually there is a question related to that um i think the astronomical calculations are used you know have become popular in recent times there are many uh many people maybe nilesh ok being one of them but raj vedan is another there are few others who are Are working in that field and they're coming up with somewhat different answers and you know that's understandable given the the state of that that entire you know science is relatively new applying that to history is relatively new okay. so there's there's a lot more to be done in that field yeah uh, but uh, what is your thought on you know this is a question from the uh, from one of the audience what is your thought on the time frame of our you know indian civilization uh take take some anchor points if you don't mind yeah yeah i'm uh, i'm uh, honestly i am uh, i am i'm not a scholar to be able to give a scholarly answer on this mm -hmm. uh but let me quote you know because if i quote indian historians people can say oh they may be biased so let me quote a western historian there's a western rebel historian called graham hancock who's become much more popular now because of his netflix series but uh, i had read his books uh, much much earlier before he become such a big name mm -hmm. uh, i'd read his uh, uh, a book of his called the underworld and it was late 90s 
early 2000s when I write. In fact, I actually quote mm -hmm. that book in my first book, Immortals of Melua. Mm -hmm. And uh, Graham Hancock uh, has a theory that there were civilizations that existed, anti-Taliban civilizations that existed before the end of the last great ice age, which is more than 12,000 years ago. Uh, and many of those civilizations were destroyed when the Ice Age ended and the Holocene, the present period, uh, the present uh, epoch began. Uh, obviously, when the Ice Age ended 12,000 years ago, you can imagine ice melted, sea levels would have risen. So many lands would have got flooded out. And Graham Hancock says perhaps that's why there is a flood myth across civilizations across the world because it must have been a global event, yeah. right? And uh, uh, in the underworld, he had done deep sea diving across various parts of the world, but one chapter was on India. And he'd done deep sea diving off the coast of Tamil Nadu and off mm -hmm. the coast of Gujarat. And he had found what looked like human uh, structures, what looked like uh, non-natural, what in technical terms is called an anomaly. Uh, uh, in archaeological terms, if it doesn't appear natural, they call it an anomaly. So, which mm -hmm. means it was built by humans. Uh, so, mm -hmm. he had written of it in his book, Underworld, which was published, whatever, 35, 40 years ago, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's a Western historian. He has no selfish interest in this debate. And he was covering a global event. Just one of those chapters happened to be uh, on India, which shows that if Graham Hancock is true, is right, then Indian civilization is at minimum 12,000 years old. At minimum. Uh, if Graham Hancock is right. But like I said, I'm not a scholar. We need scholarly historians with enough backing in terms of funding to be able to do this. We don't have enough. Uh, Archaeology is expensive, Jaiji. And we don't... Uh, we were a poor country also. We couldn't invest that much. But now money is increasingly not as much of an issue. So we should invest in archaeology. I'm sure you must have seen the news of the diggings at Sinoli in the no, recent past. Uh, no, but are Saswati, in, in this valley, Saswati yeah. and, It's uh, extremely know. exciting. So, first of all, Rakhi Gadi, which yeah. is much bigger than yeah. uh, Harappa and Mohanjo Daro, which has been found uh, in Haryana and yeah. in the ancient uh, Saraswati route. And it is far, far bigger than Harappa and Mohanjo Daro and it's in mm. the Indus Valley pattern. That's yeah. one thing and it goes back far further. Second, in Western UP, they dug at this place called Sinoli, mm. uh, which has been dated to uh, between two, 2200 to 2500 before Common Era, which is peak of what is called the Indus Saraswati civilization. But mm. this is outside the Indus Saraswati civilization because it's in UP, right? Mm. It's in Western UP. And it has, they found a chariot out there, yes, a yes, horse no, chariot. No, they no, found no. proper uh, swords out there. Now, again, this this discovery suddenly again changes our concept. Now we need many more. There was an there was a dig in Tamil Nadu, uh, again, which uh, I think it has been dated to some two thousand before Common Era, and then we our history books tell us there was apparently nothing in Tamil Nadu at that time. Well, we found a we found a uh, settlement there now, which again has pottery, which has so uh, we need to invest much more in archaeology. Uh, we need scholars to analyze it. But Jaiji, I would also always advise this should be done calmly uh, in a scholarly manner without swinging on extremes, without emotions. Because if we write it with emotions, then we lose credibility. You know, So it must be logical, calm and with, only based on evidence. Only based on evidence. I, you're, you're absolutely right, Mr. The, the problem, I think, is with our, you know, um, with our civilization is that we have been suppressed by colonizers for four thousand years yeah. to the point where you know our spirit spirits have been down and so when we find something interesting all of a sudden emotions come out yeah, uh, yeah so, you're absolutely uh, right absolutely right Jaiji. but we must control it for the sake yeah. of our civilization uh, what vs so, naipaul had written uh, is true we are a wounded civilization uh, but we must, to honor the sacrifice of our ancestors, we have to ensure that the truth comes out in a credible manner. Right. And that means, you know, we will, of course, feel our emotions. But when we are doing this 
this work we must learn to control our emotions and focus with the intellect and calmness and logic and yep. be driven by evidence absolutely so i'm you know while we're talking i'm also trying to curate some of the questions here uh, there's one question about you know, the boundaries of Indian uh, civilization, if you like, or Indian nation, going all the way from Afghanistan, which is well-established history. Yeah, I don't think well it needs to, be, needs to be any kind of, you know, uh, controversy it's, on that. It's, the, it's there's, pretty, there's no doubt on that. There's no doubt on that. That's, so, that's a recent Like history. I said, Kanda, you know, Gandhar, yeah. uh, I mean, Shakuni was from Gandhar, and Gandhar is modern Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, no, he, I mean, Hindu yeah. Shahi was there till the uh, 10th century. Till, till, the, till the 11th century. The, 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 yeah. till, yeah. I think the last of the Hindu Shahi kings only died around 10, 10 uh, common yeah. era or something. So, no, 11th century. Like I mean, it's a yeah. Mahmud the, uh, uh, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the way I would see it is if you look at Southeast uh, Asia, was there Indic influence? Clearly so. Uh, you know, uh, was there uh, Indic influence uh, in uh, above uh, the Himalayas, up to Central Asia? Clearly so. Uttar Kuru, for example. Uh, uh, but again, this needs calm analysis. Uh, there were uh, cases where uh, uh, a king in Cambodia, the royal dynasty had died out and they imported a related family from Tamil Nadu to become the king in Cambodia. So that shows that even that was actually a part of the Indic uh, sphere. Now that's one aspect. We should analyze it logically and calmly. But the second thing, the way I would see it is we shouldn't get into uh, saying that, oh, we were so great in the past, you know, uh, because that can turn negative. We should use that greatness of our ancestors as a fuel to re-achieve greatness again. Uh, there should come a time when, uh, in a few decades, in a few generations, when just like in the past, many across Asia should want to Indianize themselves. We should be that powerful and attractive uh, a nation, a civilization. Absolutely. When you talk about Cambodia, the uh, you know the connection with Thailand is well understood, well known. Connect connection with even Korea. Very true. And they uh, all Indianize themselves. Yeah, even connection with Korea is. Uh, you're you know, right. You're right. The the Ayodhya, uh, the the uh, Huang Gok, uh, because she was uh, who was Princess Suri Ratna from Ayodhya, and uh, uh, there's there's a significant uh, part of the Kim surname uh, tribe, which right. actually uh, claims uh, descent from Huang Gok, who was a princess from Ayodhya, actually. Absolutely. You're right. Absolutely. Okay, um, having a hard time catching up with all the questions. Some of them are uh, almost, you know, uh, mini essays. So it's uh, difficult for me to, um, you know, summarize everything. Did people identify with their kingdom more than with their party identity? The, uh, the assumption in that is you have to choose between the two, right? It's like, I mean, do you love your father and your mother? And someone says, no, no, you have to pick one. Can we really pick one? You know, we can love both. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, you know, in Maharashtra, uh, it's very common among uh, us to say Jai Maharashtra. But you'll notice that they'll always say Jai Hind, Jai Maharashtra. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that uh, you love one at the cost of the other. And the Indian concept of nationhood is not an insecure concept of nationhood, like the European uh, European one. The challenge is if someone says that you cannot say Jai Hind, that India didn't exist. Yeah, no, that has to be unacceptable. But there is no, I, I don't think there's a problem if people have a sense of identity in the local province and the nation. There's nothing wrong with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so here's, a, I guess, a statement followed with a question. Uh, of course, Muslims destroyed much of our history and Britishers uh, also destroyed or distorted it, which is same as destruction in my books. Um, and even after independence, of course, uh, that was, you know, it took a long time to even wake up to rectifying it, let alone actually rectify it. So, um, you know, you have any comments on, you know, whether, first of all, I think that's that's truism. I mean, we, you know, we don't need to so, debate, debate that point. Yeah, so the yeah. way I would see it, Jayaji, is uh, from, uh, we've had a thousand years of foreign rule. Yeah. 
from the 11th to the 17th century, there were Turks and Turko Mongols ruling us. Um, uh, there has uh, been an unfortunate, uh, you know, image created that the people ruling us were Indian Muslims. The actually Indian Muslims are the Paswanda uh, Muslims. They were as oppressed uh, uh, in those days. Uh, and Bollywood has added to the confusion because we think that, you know, that Akbar looked like Hrithik Roshan and uh, Laudin Khilji looked like uh, Ranveer Singh, which is not true. To us, they would have looked Mongoloid. To us, they would have looked Chinese. But they were actually Turkic. They were from, Turkic people aren't originally from Turkey. They're actually from Central Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, even Turkey was actually conquered by them. Uh, and they they wiped out the, the, the Greek men. They took over the women and made it Turkey. Um, they didn't speak Urdu. They spoke Turkic or Persian. They were foreigners, very clearly. Their rule was exceptionally violent. Uh, there has to be some scientific, uh, you know, uh, analysis of how much mm -hmm. our population declined uh, in that era. But from the 11th to the 17th century, there was exceptional violence. In fact, there's this uh, American uh, uh, historian who said that uh, the Turkic conquest of India is perhaps the bloodiest conquest in human history. Uh, but Will, Will, Durant. Durant, Will Durant, as you know. Uh, but their attacks were primarily violent. So the Indian society still remained strong. The British were actually far more capable. The Turks were basically just killers. They didn't. They weren't really good at much else, right? The British were actually capable. Uh, they weren't just conquerors. They were also brilliant businessmen. They were also brilliant intellectuals. So they actually didn't just. They killed millions in man-made famines. They carried out horrific violence, but they also did intellectual attacks and economic attacks. So the British attack. And both the Turks and the British were foreigners. They didn't care for us. But the British were far more capable. So their negative impact on India was actually far worse. Because we didn't just lose in terms of violence. Even intellectually, we were destroyed. And which is why even post-independence, you find so many Indians like this concept that India didn't exist as a nation. That's a British intellectual victory. We've suffered this for a thousand years. It won't turn around so quickly. We all have to put our shoulder to the wheel. And actually, that's what even programs like this attempt to do. That's what yeah. I'm trying to do with my books, documentaries, podcasts as well. Yeah. By the way, I think you can take this as a compliment. Uh, one of the uh, comments is uh, what the speaker is saying makes a lot of sense and we should be taught in schools. Obviously, obviously you would agree Thank with you. that. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> Um, but I think the point uh, you just made is that uh, British were, you know, uh, call them intellectual, call them cunning. You know, they had ways to, they obviously infected our minds. Mm. Even to this day, they are, you know, it's, it's like it's like a virus that affected your mind and, uh, you know, makes you makes you think like and become become intellectually idiot. In a, Absolutely. In a Absolutely. Uh, and the. Uh, the fact that after even after independence for so many decades, uh, we didn't realize that we need to actually recover our uh, civilizational history is because our minds were infected and still are to, to a large extent, at least in the intellectual, uh, so-called intellectual community. So, which, which shows the extent of the British complete victory. Correct. And Correct. And shows their capability. I mean, I, if you put emotions aside, yes, they were very capable. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, they... they and, knew, yeah. and to uh, me, Jayji, one key lesson, another key lesson from the British. Do you know at the peak of British Raj, there were more than 100,000 British in India. Uh, they ruled 250 million of us for nearly 200 years. 350 yeah. million by the time they left. Uh, just 100,000 of them. A, it shows, of course, their capability. B, it also shows internal divisions because there were a class of Indians who they created who ruled okay. India for the British. Ghar ka bhedi lanka dhai. There isn't a bigger example than this. Yeah. Actually, I have uh, I've read somewhere that after the Battle of Plassey, when Clive uh, was leading a uh, actually parade uh, through the town, 
there were people on the sidelines cheering. And I think someone said, if we had only all of us spit in their direction, they would have drowned. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we had to spit in their and, and we had to spit in their direction as opposed to spitting on each other. <laughs> that was the difference. That's that's, that's a that's a point, Jay Z. Internal divisions, then a stranger king appears the most logical bet. So we've, we've had a nationalistic government in power for the last 10 years. You have the history being taught in schools is still distorted and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, I think we are obviously, you know, becoming impatient. Yeah. And, and, and we should be to some degree, but at the same time, well, I'll, I'll let you address it rather than me trying to... Maybe this is, it what? is, uh, India is like a super tanker. Yeah. And the government is trying to restructure while turning the shape, while while we are out at sea. It's a much more difficult job than it appears. Uh, and what uh, they are trying to address is not just a few decades, but a few centuries of, uh, of colonization. Um, but people should know that actually a committee has been set up already. Uh, uh, Mrs. Murthy is heading that committee. Various... Uh, historians have been part which are looking at the books at the state level many things are happening uh so we should uh and we should of course keep putting pressure but realize that actually a lot of things are happening also we must to be fair we must uh, excuse me acknowledge that i think absolutely i, I had the privilege of uh, actually conversing with dr um kapil kapoor uh you know he's a, yeah. you know yeah. as you know uh, prominent intellectual in the education space Mm. Uh, he, in fact, is the, you know, one of the authors of the new education policy. policy yeah. And, you know, I, he, you know, he said, look, there is a tremendous change, sea change that is taking place. It's just that it takes time for it to take yeah. roots and, and uh, you know, things will happen. I mean, I think we have right to be somewhat impatient. But at the same time, as you pointed out, it's a big ship trying to turn the big ship around takes, uh, yeah. takes time and, and effort. And, you know, even sometimes, you know, most uh, uh, well-intentioned things. I mean, you take CAA, for example, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a slightly different uh, context, uh, there is tremendous opposition from not only, you know, from inside, but also from the outside. You know, okay. uh, so how does a, you know, a government sort of move forward and make progress in some of these more difficult areas uh, in the face of some of you know, this, this kind of uh, opposition? But yeah. so India is a difficult country. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah, it's a you know C, whether it's a CAA, whether it's a, you know farm policy and you know the, the farmers uh, movement yeah. and all that. You know, even things that are obviously in the interest of the nation, correct? You know, face tremendous opposition internally as well as externally. So progress, by definition, will have to be uh, measured, if you like. But we are the way I see it is yes, things are difficult, but we are like an elephant. We move slowly, but we move surely. <laughs> we, we move for sure. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, Amishi, I think uh, uh, it's been uh, an unmitigated pleasure, I must say. Um, I and I look forward to more conversations of this uh, this nature on you know related topics and perhaps uh, somewhat more. Um, you know, more difficult topics even uh, in, in future. So great, uh, you know, we made the connection and now, you know, uh, you won't be able to get rid of me that easily. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Jaisi, and looking forward to more interactions. And to those of you who are following, do check out my podcast as well, Immortal India with Amish. It's there on YouTube. Just type at the rate author Amish, A-U-T-H-O-R-A-M-I-S-H and hope you guys like it.